and in between the wall and the fire, people walk up and down with sort of um, models of things. So let's go back to my example. So an elephant, a horse, a cow, and a person. And people carry them backwards and forwards. And sometimes the people who are carrying are talking. And the people who are sitting facing the wall see, cast by the fire, the shadows of what is carried. And that's all that they see. And they spend their lives having discussions about, oh, look, it's a horse, they go. Oh, no, 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 it's an elephant next. I said it was going to be an elephant next. And they have little competitions about who can work out what's going to come next. But all of their lives are dominated by the shadows in front of them. At one point, suddenly, one of the prisoners gets released and gets allowed to turn around, and they go, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on here? No, 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 these are very weird horses and elephants that are being carried up and down. They're not real. What's real is what I used to see on the television in front of me. Eventually they come to see that what they used to see was shadow play cast by these objects that are carried around. And then they turn around and they walk up out of the cave into the sunlight where they see the real originals. They see a real horse and they go, crikey, that's what reality is like. Then they turn around and come back in again and try and uh, persuade everybody that they're all, to persuade all the still tied up prisoners that they've got it all wrong and everybody puts them to death. <laughs> now, normally that account of what Plato says is glossed or explained as Plato thought that the sensible world was, full, was an illusion and that all we see are shadows and that nothing's real. You know, when, I, <laughs> when I do that, nothing, when that happens, nothing's really. But what Plato is interested in, some otherworldly reality, and nothing to do with any of the questions that I put to you earlier. Now think again. So imagine that you're the prisoners, and that's the wall, and the light is shining actually at head level from the back. Now, what Plato says is, have such people, first of all, first of all, seen anything of themselves or each other, do you think? Save the shadows cast by the fire on the wall of the cave in front of them. How could they have? if they have been compelled to hold their heads fixed throughout their lives. Now, think about it again, okay? So look there, don't look at me, but look there, and imagine that on that wall, your shadow is cast. There's shadows of horses and cows and all that stuff as well, but your own shadow. You can't move your head, and you have never seen anything else, so you can't see anything else except the shadow. How do you say, that's me? You point at the shadow and you go, that's me. How do you do that? How could you refer to yourself and be wrong? How could you even start to say, of the shadow on the wall, that that's you, and that the you that it is, is the you that guesses the next image that's going to come up in the order of things that are coming up. How could that happen? Well, the answer is, actually, it couldn't. What Plato is suggesting is that in this existence where you're all looking over there, you could not discover who you are. You could not discover and get right, that's me. The reason that you couldn't get right, that's me, is because figuring out who you are is not 
just a matter of the first person singular. It's not just a matter, it's not that De Descartes got the wrong end of the stick on this account. Because Descartes supposed that the I is where you begin. Plato supposes that you cannot begin with the I. Plato's argument is that the only way you're going to understand who you are is if I undo your chains and you get up and you turn around and you come back down again and see yourself. Not your shadow, but yourself. The argument that Plato is giving us is not that self-knowledge is easy or the argument that it's impossible. So it's neither Sainsbury's argument nor Hume's. But his argument is that, that self-knowledge, all of the stuff about self-reference and self-aspiration and self-interest, is predicated on a kind of understanding that requires you really to know everything there is about yourself. And that until you do that, you can't understand for a moment what it would be to decide what to do in cases of difficult moral decisions, what kinds of things that you ought to do in cases of how we should live our lives. So his argument seems to me to, so what I want to put to you is that this old Greek argument is one that isn't in the modern analytic philosophy tradition central. But it should be because just as in the other just so stories or the rule story or whatever, there's a connection between self-reference and self-interest, so there should be in all the other thought experiments that are about how we get hold of the self. And that's something that Plato saw, and since then, I think has become something that people miss. I shall. Um, I think we've got time for two or three quick questions. I'm so sorry. No, no, no. Um, anyone want to ask a question? Um, so obviously you talked a lot about the self. Do you think the self could be in any way relative? So you might live in a society where uh, perhaps you don't perceive of yourself so much as an individual, but you might aspire to perceive yourself as part of a collective or part of a unit. Do you think that, that, that there might be a difference between different I think that might be right. I mean, then the question, two questions may be arrived. One of the questions would be whether what that does is undermine completely, maybe a jolly good thing too, all the um, thought experiments and stories that base, base themselves on something that's self-interest. Because you cut that away from the beginning. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that... And it, you, what you describe may be, um, as it were, sociologically accurate. There's a question whether there's a question whether we might aspire differently, which is what Plato would say we should. So a different version of Plato's cave would be, well, actually, you know, all we are are our contexts, and we need to be able to understand ourselves context-free. And that's a huge issue in contemporary philosophy. And I don't think I can... I mean, my inclination is platonic rather than contextual. Um, but I can see that that might just be obstinacy. That might be a grossly inflated sense of self. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, do you think that the self that you've talked about is something that you're sort of born as, or is it something that you make by the decisions you make, like what job you have? For I think Plato would. Um, I, th I think Plato would think you make it because he thinks that you come to um, self-knowledge by 